Remember first semester when you'd be given a function and you'd be asked to find the intervals of increasing and decreasing or the intervals of concave up or concave down or the points of inflection or the relative extrema? Well, we can find all of those same things for an integral defined function such as the one shown. In this video, I will show you how to find the location of a horizontal tangent line and then I will show you how to determine if there is a relative max, a relative min, or neither at that particular value. Remember that a horizontal tangent line will occur where the derivative is equal to zero. So our strategy will be, let's find the derivative of this function and set it equal to zero. The common case of the second fundamental theorem of calculus says that if you have an integral defined function where the lower limit is a constant and the upper limit is x, the derivative will just be f of x. In other words, replace the placeholder variable with x and that's the derivative. This is the common case since we have a constant for the lower limit and we have x for the upper limit. Therefore, the derivative can be obtained by just writing down the inner function but putting an x instead of a t. So there's your derivative right there. To find the location of a horizontal tangent line, we set the derivative equal to zero. If we set x squared equal to zero, we can immediately see that x equals zero. So now we know that capital F of x has a horizontal tangent line at x equals zero. Next, we need to determine whether capital F of x has a relative maximum, a relative minimum, or neither at x equals zero. We can use the first derivative test to figure this out. Let's make a sign chart and see where capital F prime changes signs. There will only be one row, and that's the x squared. x squared will always be positive, which of course means that capital F prime is positive in both intervals. We can tell that capital F of x has neither a relative max nor a relative min at x equals zero because capital F prime does not change signs at x equals zero. And again, this was your first derivative test. We need to do the same thing for problem number eight. So the first step will be to find the derivative of capital G of X. However, this is not the common case that we had before. We don't have a constant for the lower limit, and we don't have simply X for the upper limit. So we need to use something called the general form of the second fundamental theorem of calculus. So here's how the general form works. We have a function for the lower limit, and we have another function for the upper limit. To find the derivative, you plug in the upper function first, and then you multiply by the derivative of the upper function. It's a little bit like the chain rule. And then you subtract, and now you plug in the lower function, and you multiply by the derivative of the lower function. Let's give it a try. To find the first derivative, we will plug in the upper function. So I will have natural log of 2x, but I will multiply by the derivative of the upper function. It's a little bit like doing the chain rule. The derivative of 2x is 2, but I think I will put the 2 in the front. And then we subtract. Now we plug in the lower function. So I'm going to have the natural log of x. And then you multiply by the derivative of the lower function, but the derivative of x is just 1, and we don't need that. So, so let's erase that. So this is an expression for the first derivative of the integral defined function. However, we need to use the properties of logarithms to simplify this further. Here's the first rule. If we have a constant 
times a logarithm. We can take that constant and put it as the exponent. So c times the natural log of a would equal the natural log of a to the c power. You can see how that might apply to this first term. We have this 2 in the front, so we can move this and put it as the exponent. So we will have 2x squared. I think I will go ahead and write this as 4x squared. Let's just go ahead and square this. And then we bring down minus natural log x. But here comes another property of logarithms that we will need. If I have the natural log of a minus the natural log of b, I can write this as a single log of a over b. So you can see how that might apply to this problem. We can rewrite this difference of logs as a single log of 4x squared over x. But one of these x's will cancel out and we are left with the natural log of 4x. In order to find the location of a horizontal tangent line, we need to set the derivative equal to 0. So we have the natural log of 4x equals 0. To solve this, we can exponentiate both sides of the equation. So I'm going to drop a base e on both sides, making each side the exponent of the e. Base e and natural log e are inverse functions, so they cancel each other out. And that just leaves the 4x. So on the left side of the equation, we have 4x. A constant raised to the 0 power is 1. So now we have 4x equals 1. Dividing both sides by 4, and we get x equals 1 fourth. So this is the location of a horizontal tangent line. Next, we need to determine if capital G of x has a relative max, a relative min, or neither at x equals 1 fourth. We have learned two different ways to do this. We can either use the first derivative test or the second derivative test. I'm going to show you both. For the first derivative test, we make a sign chart to see if the first derivative changes signs at 1 fourth. So I'm starting my sign chart at 0 because natural log is not defined for values of x that are 0 or less. So we need to pick a value between 0 and 1 fourth as our first test value. So let's let x equal, let's say, 1 eighth and see what happens. So that will be the natural log of 4 times 1 eighth. But that would equal the natural log of 1 half. Hmm, is this positive or negative? I still can't tell. This would be the same thing as the natural log of 2 to the negative 1 power. Using that property of logarithms that I mentioned before in reverse, we can take this negative exponent and put it back to the front. So this would equal negative natural log of 2, which is definitely less than 0. So in that way, we can tell that we have negative values in the first interval. For the next interval, we need to pick a value that is greater than 1 fourth. Let's use x equals 1. So we would have the natural log of 4 times 1, which of course is just the natural log of 4, which is clearly positive. If you are very familiar with the graphs of logarithmic functions, you are not surprised that it is negative on the left and positive on the right. We conclude that capital G of X has a relative min at X equals 1 fourth because capital G prime changes from negative to positive at X equals 1 fourth. Remember, it makes sense that we have a relative min at x equals 1 fourth because the original function, capital G of x, changes from decreasing to increasing at x equals 1 fourth. Now I'll show you how to tell if you have a relative max, a relative min, or neither using the second derivative test. Obviously, we will need to find the second derivative. Don't forget the memorized rule. 
the derivative of natural log u is 1 over u times u prime. The derivative of 4x is 4, but I'm going to put the 4 in the top. The 4s cancel out, and we have 1 over x. If we want to find out if there is a relative max, a relative min, or neither at 1 fourth, we evaluate the second derivative at 1 fourth. In this case, it would just be 1 over 1 fourth. When you divide by a fraction, you multiply by the reciprocal. So we have 4, which is obviously greater than 0, and that's what matters. Remember that the second derivative test always has two parts to it. We summarize and justify by saying capital G of x has a relative min at x equals 1 fourth because capital G prime at 1 fourth is equal to 0 and capital G double prime at 1 fourth is positive. This makes sense because the second derivative indicates concavity. The fact that G double prime at 1 fourth is positive indicates that capital G is concave up. Thus, any horizontal tangent line will be at a minimum. 